Hello all and uh, welcome to the first video talking about uh, linguistic anthropology. Um, linguistic anthropology, as I had mentioned before, if you think back to the beginning of the semester when I first introduced the idea of the four uh, subfields of anthro, linguistic anthropology is the smallest of the four subfields and very much um, uh, tied to cultural anthropology because language and culture are so intrinsically bound up with each other. They're, they're such a fundamental part um, of one another that you really can't study one without the other. And so we divide them up because it's a very different skill set. Um, we look at different things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, linguistic anthropologists are usually pretty good cultural anthropologists. And cultural anthropologists are okay linguistic anthropologists. Um, but there's a lot of different aspects to it, and I kind of want to run through some of that. You've probably heard of people being referred to as linguists before. Linguists and linguistic anthropologists are different things. Um, the primary thing being that as linguistic anthropologists, just like everything else that we've been talking about, um, we're interested in how language links in with the rest of human life and activity. Um, and so how language is a reflection of and a shaper of our culture, our values, our worldview, our ideology, how who you are is expressed through language, and not just how words are formed or what the dictionary definition of them is and things like that, um, but rather um, how it speaks to who we are fundamentally. And some of this is kind of a difficult concept to explain. Uh, I'm going to try to break up linguistics into just two videos. I want to keep these short. But at the same time, some of this takes a little bit of involved conversation <clears throat> to really get at, right? So um, hopefully we'll be able to do that, okay? So what we're going to be talking about really is, is, is uh, forms of communication um, and, uh, and meaning uh, and how we express meaning to one another, okay? So on all of these slides, I'm gonna, I'll try to have the camera on just so that we can have a little bit of interaction, but if it kind of doesn't work quite right with the um, slide itself, I'll just turn it off for that portion of it as I am with this one. So we are talking about communication here, not just language, as I was saying. Um, uh, we'll kind of come to the difference in just a second. So communication includes gestures, clothing, hairstyle, body art, jewelry, ornamentation. It includes silence. It includes grooming habits. It includes everything about us. Um, I've often pointed out in class, and you guys have, have often laughed at me, that like, you know, I look around the room and, and I always see that we are wearing jerseys that identify us. We're, as, as fans of particular sports teams, we're wearing... Um, you know, clothes and shirts and things that are like, uh, oh, this, you know, uh, half marathon that you did or this, um, uh, you know, sport that you played or <clears throat> brands that you like or bands that you enjoy or these kinds of things, right? We communicate a lot. Um, you know, we wear, we wear crosses. We wear, you know, lots and lots and lots of different things. We wear um, head coverings and scarves and people wear veils and people wear all of this stuff, right? Um, it's important to understand that none of this is quote unquote normal. None of this is quote unquote natural natural. All of this is a choice that we make, right? That is culturally determined. There's no such thing as normal clothes. All of it's cultural. And if you want to talk about somebody in the highlands of Bolivia, if you want to talk about um, somebody in the Middle East, if you want to talk about somebody in the Himalayas, if you want to talk about somebody in Tampa, Florida, it does not matter. They're all wearing um, culturally prescribed clothing. None of it's normal, right? Which is not to say that none of it, that it's, it's bad. It's just the reality that all of this is a, is a kind of cultural fiction that we have created. Okay. And so we're talking about a lot of different forms of communication. And uh, we should mention here briefly about the origin of language. There's a long history of studying exactly where language comes from. Um, the reality of it is we don't have a perfect view of this. Um, it could have been a couple million years ago with the rise of our genus Homo. Um, certainly by the time we get to Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago, we have language. Um, uh, um, a lot of people kind of debate, you know, exactly where and exactly when. Um, um, for most of us in cultural anthropology, that's less interesting of a question, you know. Um, but I, I, I would 
say probably since uh, Genus Homo came about, we've um, been speaking. Um, but nonetheless, there's still some, some debates about that because unfortunately, uh, language doesn't leave much that's tangible, you know. Um, people could be speaking and singing and conversing and talking, and it's not going to leave any kind of a material record for us to study. I'll uh, leave the video on, even though it chops off a couple of these words here at the bottom, but I think we can still get around it. Um, where, did, where does language come from? Um, we all agree that there's really uh, kind of the animal origins of language, as we often say. What I mean by that is that um, there was already a lot of biological things that were in place for human beings to have language, right? And we can see this in the animal world. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and so, you know, I think you guys have seen things like uh, chimpanzees, uh, like uh, 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 Washu the chimp or um, Coco the gorilla or things like that, uh, you know, that, that have learned sign language. A lot of people are under the mistaken impression about those animals that their sign language was much more robust than it actually turned out to be. Um, there were some pretty speculative, rather wild claims that were made. Um, both in the media, but also even by some of the researchers that studied these animals, um, because they were very fond of them, they were very connected to them, they kind of saw what they wanted to see. It was a little bit of a Rorschach test, like we talked about before. They saw what they wanted to see, and, and sometimes they overstated what they were doing, and so um, an easy example of this is, is sort of... Um, um, the, how they trained these animals was that, you know, if you got the word right, if you made the right sign, you would um, <clears throat> you'd get a treat. And um, one of the things that ended up happening is that these animals learned that. And as soon as the handler would walk into the enclosure, they'd just start making signs for different things. Boy, table, chair, ball, sky, bird, you know, things like that, because they just they just wanted their treat, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so they would hold up like a glass and then the, the animal would make the sign for you know, boy, and it would make the sign for chair, and then it would make the sign for glass, and they'd say, oh, see, made the sign for glass, it knew, um, and that's really not, I mean, think about, you know, when you guys took, like, Spanish class in high school, you can't just, like, start saying words and hope you hit the right one, that's not how it worked, um, so a lot of that was, frankly, overstated, but nonetheless, not all of it was overstated, they, they definitely were able to understand the symbolic meaning of, of language and, and what was going on behind it, right? Um, parrots can certainly make mimic sounds, you know, dolphins have extraordinary complex communication, whales have extraordinarily complex communication, and, and very individualized, sort of localized, different groups of whales communicate with different sounds and in different ways. Um, and so it's quite complex, and they can teach each other when they move between pods, whale pods. Um, <clears throat> so it's really complex. Uh, dogs, if you have a dog, you know that dogs have word understanding. Um, no, dogs don't speak exactly, but, um, you know, any of you that have a dog, know, you can't say walk around the dog because the dog knows what walk is. Uh, and some of you even have dogs, I've had friends that had dogs that you can't spell walk anymore because the dog knows how to spell walk now, um, or food or vet or things like that, right? So, um, so there's certainly a, 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 an underlying biological basis for this. I'm bringing all of this up because of the one statement on here that if we were in class, I guarantee you half half of you would be yelling at me. So let me explain it before. Um, I say on here only humans have language and other animals just have communication. That is the standard line in anthropology, and frankly, I don't know that I agree with it, right? I bring it up because this is what you would probably learn in any other class. Um, more and more, most of us are having a real problem with this. For the longest time in anthropology, throughout mo oh, pretty much all of the 20th century. Um, anthropologists were very sort of self-important about like, nope, only humans have language. Um, usually we would define language in a way that made sure that only humans had it. So it would be like, oh, language is symbolism and writing and all of this other stuff, right? Um, I don't think that that's fair. I think that we are not been looking at the right things. I think that we have only recently started trying to understand the full complexity of animal communication. Um, I think as we look at birds, as we look at, like I said, dolphins and whales, um, as we look at a lot of animals, I think research is getting better. Researchers are getting smarter. Researchers are asking better questions. Personally, I don't think 
only humans have language. Personally, I think that um, um, a lot of animals communicate in much more sophisticated ways. We even have evidence of interspecies communication or cross-species communication, where birds that give alarm calls, other animals recognize those alarm calls that like a predator is nearby and they change their behavior based on it. And so really what you're talking about is being able to hear that and go, oh, I know that he just said there's something here. Um, there's something dangerous. I'm a deer, so I'm going to run off, even though that was a robin that was calling. That's pretty damn impressive in my opinion. And so I don't really uh, uh, agree with that. Now, with that said, the best research that we have so far, emphasis on the so far, is that there is this vast difference in complexity, subtlety, flexibility, all of this um, when you talk about human language compared to animal language. And a good example of this is if I said to you, lightsaber. Okay. Um, I've always had one or two students that's never seen Star Wars, but even they know what a lightsaber is. Every single one of you knows what a lightsaber is. Now, lightsabers don't exist. And in fact, lightsabers cannot exist because lightsabers, lasers don't work that way. Light doesn't work that way. You can't, it, light waves don't move three feet and then stop, right? It defies the laws of physics. So not only is there not a lightsaber, it literally cannot exist. And yet I can say lightsaber and all of you know what I'm talking about. You're probably even making the sound in your head right now, right? Um, you know what I mean. And every other kind of animal out there, we see it, when it makes sounds, it's about direct stimulus. It is looking for food. It is looking for um, others of its species. It sees a predator. It's frightened by something. Its biological clock kicks in. It's trying to breed. It is direct stimulus that causes this. You and I don't have to have that. You and I don't have to see a lion to talk about a lion. And we don't see animals doing that. Um, we don't see animals communicating with each other in that way. Um, we can talk about things that aren't, never were. We could, uh, for example, I could say like, what would America be like if the British won the American Revolution, if we never got independence? You and I could spend months talking about, uh, you know, everything from would we still be a colony? Uh, what would our economy look like? How would Brexit have been different? Would we drink tea more than coffee? Would we drive on the left side of the road? I mean, on and on and on and on and on, right? So we could talk about all of these different things, um, even though that didn't happen. It's not real, right? It's, it's, it's pretend we did win the American Revolution. That's an incredibly complex um, form of communication that we have to discuss things that don't even exist you know and so there there is a difference there is a difference certainly in the complexity of, of how we communicate compared to animals though I'm still rather uncomfortable saying that what they have is not language so I keep saying communication and language and we ought to really talk about what that actually means communication is the process of sending and receiving meaningful messages okay so it is it is communicating things this is why i say things like dress do it i'm sitting here wearing a tie as i always do when i teach because i i enjoy wearing a tie um and it's as i've said before you know when i wear this it's really funny i can go into a gas station on saturday or sunday get gas buy myself a gatorade and on saturday and sunday i'm wearing a t-shirt and flip-flops and the guy behind the counter is like, hey, bro, what's up? Or, hey, chief, how you doing? You know, what's up, man? How's your day? You know, on Monday morning when I'm headed to work and I walk in wearing a shirt and tie and all of the rest of it, the same guy looks at me and goes, good morning, sir. How are you? Right. Um, there, this communicates something. And it's not just that it sends a message, but we, we receive that message. <clears throat> right. Um, you know, we, we, we respond to these things, right? And so our clothing and our hair and our jewelry, you know, um, and our tattoos and our grooming, you know, if somebody walks up to you on the street in a three piece suit, before they even say anything to you, you respond very, very different than you do that guy who is disheveled and dirty and doesn't have shoes on and, you know, has tattered clothes. Um, the reality is that uh, we respond to these messages, right? Language is a form of communication, okay? 
Um, so language is a systematic set of symbols and signs with learned and shared meaning. Okay, uh, and by uh, symbols, <clears throat> I mean something very specific. A symbol is anything that stands for something else. Okay, but has no inherent meaning in and of itself. Okay, so for example, I've got a few images on the screen here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, don't worry, I'm not sick. Uh, I've got a few images here. The first one you'll notice is a dollar sign. All of you know what this looks like. All of you know that it's a positive thing, right? Does that look like our money? No. In fact, does that symbol even appear on our money? No. That symbol never appears on uh, United States currency. And yet all of us know that that is money, that that is what money looks like, okay? Or, or it not looks like, excuse me, it, that's, we all know that that represents money, right? Um, that's a symbol. It has no inherent meaning in and of itself. The British came up with a different symbol to mean money, the pound symbol that's sort of a curvy L with a line through it. Um, the, the Japanese came up with a different symbol to mean money. It's like the Y with a couple of lines in it to represent the yen. Um, everybody, you know, different people around the globe have come up with different symbols. None of it looks like their money, right? But we all know that this means money, right? Um, the next one is one of my favorites. Um, that uh, that middle symbol there is called an ampersand, right? And all of you have seen it. All of you know that it means and, right? But what's cool about this is that that's a symbol of a symbol of a symbol because that symbol is used to stand in for the word and, A-N-D, three letters, right? In that order, it means in addition to, or also, or adding on to that, right? And so that little symbol actually represents th another symbol, those, those three symbols combined, A and D, right? Because the A letter does not make the A sound. We just agree that it does. The N, the D, it doesn't mean N or D. We just agree it means A, N, D, and we put it together. But the interesting thing is, those sounds I'm making are symbols too. We don't have to, uh, A and D and and does not have to mean in addition to, we just agree that it does, right? It's learned and shared meaning. We just all said that it would. It could be anything else, right? And uh, that's why in other languages you can say and and it doesn't mean that, right? Those sounds are symbols, okay? Speech is symbolic communication. Okay, we just agree that these sounds make, or excuse me, have the meaning that they do. And so the ampersand is a symbol that stands in for this other symbol that stands in for this other symbol, right? Ampersand and written and is a sound, okay? <clears throat> and lastly um, is an emoji. And I made sure to not have a, a kind of contemporary modern emoji there but the kind of old school version, you know, 1.0 of emojis where you would have uh, a semicolon followed by a parenthesis, and that means a wink, winky face, right? Now, those things, again, for the longest, and, and, and I'm bringing this up because one of the things that really frustrates me as, a, as an anthropologist is how often we um, want to fight against change, and we're going to talk about change in a second, but um, the idea that there's something wrong with emojis or that it's not a valid form of communication, as frankly people my age and older sometimes want to be all bougie and claim, is just bullshit. Um, the reality is that that's what communication is, because we all know that this has a shared meaning, and we all know that the meaning happens within the context of things, right? If, um, if I don't know, you and I were uh, texting each other, um, and I said, good luck on your exam, and sent you that winky face, it's just kind of a friendly, like, thumbs up, like, hey, you know, wait, you know, good luck, you'll do it, right? If, however, um, someone else that you know sent you that message, not that message, but sent you a winky face in a different context, it means something else, right? Um, and so if um, your mom texts you and says, I love you with a winky face, it's kind of an insider thing. But if somebody you've been talking to sends you a message at, one o'clock in the morning that says you up winky face right that's a very different context of what they're trying to communicate to you at one o'clock in the morning you know being flirtatious and you know it's probably a booty call that kind of thing right so um this communicates this communicates just fine right 
um, just as those other symbols do. Another way to speak, uh, to think about language is to say that it's a form of communication, right? Expressed between two mutually intelligible speakers that goes back to the learned and shared thing, right? And the mutually intelligible speakers is really, really critical here because one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that they want to claim that there is a right way and a wrong way to speak. And that's just not reality. If you and I both understand each other, then it's a perfectly valid form of a language. Korean is a fine language. I don't speak it, but that doesn't matter. It's absolutely a language. Um, Russian is a language. I don't speak it, but it's a perfectly valid language. Sign language, American Sign Language, is a perfectly valid language. I don't speak it, but that's not the rubric for it. If the two people that do speak it or use it um, can understand one another, then it's a valid form of communication. And I'm about to uh, focus on the fact that language changes all the time, right? What you see on the screen before you is English, I promise. It really, really is English. Look it over for a second and tell me if you can figure out what it is, okay? I promise it's English. In reality, what this is, is uh, something that you all probably know, the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? This is the Lord's Prayer written in English in the year 1000, okay? Uh, as you can see, English looks a little different than it used to. That's because it's changed. That's because it has been altered over time as all languages have. So as I said, languages change all the time, right? When you look at the Lord's Prayer from the year 1000, um, it looks real different than we write today. That's that's just the process of it. It's pronounced different. We use different words. English is a particularly weird little language um, because um, we have borrowed from other languages more than most. Um, um, this is an actual statistic. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, which is easily the most respected dictionary and collection of English words or words that are used in the English language, 99% of them, I'm not exaggerating, I mean literally 99% of them are not English. They're borrow words that we got from other languages, be it Latin or French or Scandinavian or Arabic or any number of other languages out there. Um, <clears throat> we borrow languages all the time. It's why English looks a little bit differently, too. For some of you that are native English speakers that tried to learn other languages like um, Spanish or French, and you had to deal with the idea of genders, right? Uh, in Spanish, the L and la, for example. Um, um, the English doesn't have that, and that can be a real struggle for English speakers to learn, right? So it's not El Mesa, it's La Mesa, right? Um, those kinds of things. We don't have that, and the reason that we don't in English, we used to, okay? We used to have it many, many centuries ago. Uh, um, the reason that we dropped it is because we borrowed so many words from other languages that it kind of stopped working. Um, and we borrowed so much grammatical structure from different languages that it kind of stopped working because we were trying to put two things together that didn't fit. And so we just kind of had to drop that and be like, the, everything is just the, right? And now it'll fit together, okay? And so this is why we often talk about English is. Um, the idea that there is a proper English is just stupid. Um, what was proper English 100 years ago is not proper English today. And in that time, what was pro proper English 100 years before that was not proper then. English changes constantly. This is why if you ask most like English professors who is the greatest writer in the English language, I guarantee you a good chunk of them are going to say Shakespeare. All of you, I'm sure, have had to read Shakespeare in school, and I bet all of you were frustrated as hell because you're like, I don't understand what he's talking about. He's writing in English. You speak English. How come you can't understand the guy? You can't understand the guy because English changes all the time, right? And 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 words change and meanings change. There's a number of, of uh, passages that Shakespeare have that we still don't know what he meant. Uh, turns of phrase, expressions, words that he used that we look at and we go, we don't actually know what that even is, right? Um, and so... Um, words change, language changes, uh, meanings change, pronunciation changes, all of this kind of stuff, right? And so the idea that there's a right and a wrong English is just kind of childish. 
Um, this also then, as I said about mutually intelligible speakers, this gets into the idea of um, what uh, is called AAVE, African American Vernacular English, or is it sometimes called Ebonics? There's a debate about which term should be used, which term is more respectful, skipping over a lot of that. Um, AAVE, uh, or as I said, Ebonics, as it's sometimes called, um, is often criticized as being quote unquote improper English. Nothing could be further from the truth. It represents exactly what all English is, which is a version of a language, right? There isn't a right one and a wrong one. Um, it is um, mutually intelligible speakers. Can people that speak AAV understand each other and communicate their ideas? Yes. Just because I don't speak it doesn't mean that it's not a perfectly valid language, right? And this change comes about and it, it shows up in other kind of cool and interesting ways, right? Um, so, you know, you've got dialects versus languages. Honestly, a lot of times when people say dialect, they just mean a language. Um, a, a dialect is really just these, these different kind of regionalized cultural class structure versions of languages, right? Um, a lot of times when people say a dialect, they're just being sort of disrespectful that um, somebody is speaking a different version of the language than they are, right? But you also see this come about in, cre in creoles and pidgin languages, right? <clears throat> a pidgin language is when two individuals who speak different languages have to communicate and they learn a some words and some grammar and such from each other's languages, but it's not like they're really communicating. It's sort of, think of it as sort of like traveler language, right? So, um, you know, knowing how to order food or ask for the bathroom, you learn to say hello, please, and thank you, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we see pidgin languages being used a lot where two groups have to come together out of necessity. Um, but are still kind of separate a lot of the time. So, for example, like ports, um, where like ships are docking. It's like I'm I'm come I'm a sea captain. I'm coming in there. I'm docking at your port. I need to be able to communicate with you. I need to offload some, uh, uh, goods that I'm selling. I need to buy food, water, that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm going to learn some of your language. You're going to learn some of mine. We do business with each other once a month when I show up. But at the end of the day, we all go home to our families, and so we never really learn to fully communicate, right? Um, and, and we just have this mix of your language and my language. When that mix, though, becomes established with the next generation, right, that's what we refer to as a Creole language. When I say Creole, a lot of people think of Haiti. That is a Cre uh, Creole language. It's Haitian Creole. But there's lots of Creole languages around the globe. Um, Afrikaans is another one, right? Um, Creole languages are almost always kind of a sad story. You find there's, there's a little better than 60 Creole languages in the world. And what we find is they're oftentimes because of colonialism and slavery. Um, so think about it, like with a pidgin language, we go home at the end of the day. Why is it that that becomes established? Because somebody's not allowed to go home at the end of the day, right? And so for example, um, many, uh, in the, in the Caribbean, right? Like, Haitian Creole, but there's others um, that are there, like Poppy Man too. Um, for example, when during the African diaspora, when African peoples were enslaved and brought over to the Caribbean, they spoke their language, you know, oftentimes, like many of them spoke Yoruba. But once they were brought to the New World, they couldn't go home and they, they had to learn some of the language, right? And so they had to be able to communicate and, and, and the slave owners wanted to give orders and things like that. So they learned maybe a few words, but not many. And so what ended up happening is kids growing up just hear these words being used together and it makes sense to them. They're fine with it, you know? Um, um, and so they learn the meanings of these words as kids do. And, and it becomes established that that's the right way to do it. I often joke, my daughters did this because um, my daughters, uh, when they were very young, were with their grandmother a lot who spoke Spanish to them. And so one of my oldest daughter's first sentences was, I want agua. Because she learned that's what water is called from her grandmother. And uh, she heard English uh, with me. And so I want agua was a normal sentence. She wasn't trying to be clever. It just made sense to her, right? And so Creoles are these blended uh, languages, right? 
but again, all languages are a process of uh, sort of different ideas coming together. Uh, all languages are a process of, of change and infiltration, right? Um, language is not some weird sacred thing that needs to be protected from harm and kept safe and this kind of stuff. A language is robust and healthy when it's allowed to change and breathe and bring in new ideas and drop old words and add new ones and things like that. Um, you know, it, it, you know, one language that doesn't change, Latin, because it's dead. Nobody speaks it as their primary language anymore, right? And so this idea that, you know, um, newer generations coming up with new words or new meanings for words or things like that is a problem. It's just naive. Look at the word lit. Forever lit has mean start a fire, right? But now it has this huge other cultural connotation about coolness or funness or being really hip or woke or what the hell ever else. I was intentionally trying to use a few words there that are much more contemporary in their origin, right? Um, and in the context of meaning. And so that's what words do, right? Um, but it also leads to some weird ass things like why do these words rhyme? Pony, baloney. Look at the way that those things are spelled, right? We've got some weird things in our language and um, a lot of people can struggle with that when they're new to it this is actually a map of just uh, a few it's not even particularly comprehensive a few of the different versions of English that I'm talking about in North America right there's no such thing as proper English right the reality is we are all speaking English in very, very different ways from one another. We pronounce syllables differently. We pronounce consonants and vowels differently. We put words together in different ways. We have different names for things even, um, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a much more complex picture than many people uh, have had painted for them, you know. Just to give you a few examples here, um, and I'll uh, turn the video off on the next couple so that we can actually see Florida. Um, what do you uh, call those little miniature lobsters that you find in lakes and streams, right? It's a little crustacean. Well, if you're near in the American South, you probably call them a crawfish, right? In the Midwest, you're more likely to say crayfish, right? Uh, or excuse me, you're more likely to say a crawdad, whereas if you're in New England, you're actually more likely to say uh, crayfish, right? Uh, and so different parts of the country call this thing something very, very different. My favorite part of this is this map was uh, made by a guy at North Carolina State University, and you can tell that he's from the South because his null answer is, I have no word for this critter. Not, I have no word for this animal. Not, I have no word for this creature, but I have no word for this critter. That's a very Southern way of putting that. Another one is, uh, what is the generic term that you have for a sweetened carbonated beverage? Um, in most of the American South, it's actually Coke. Uh, this map's a little bit misleading. It's hard to see on this, but it's actually much darker green throughout the American South. You say a Coke. Um, in New England, you say soda. In the upper Midwest, you say pop, <laughs> right? Um, what I find really interesting about this, and one of the things that I want you to understand about language, is that you can, you can see who people are and where they come from. If you notice, most of the American South is Coke. New England is soda, and yet if you look at South Florida, which is in the South, it also is soda. Why do you think that is? Well, we argue because most of South Florida's population isn't from the South. Where's most of South Florida's population from? New England. Ah, meaning that you can actually see migratory patterns um, of people based on the words that they use for stuff. Uh, another one here really quick is what do you call that thing that you drink water from in school like out in the hallway uh, if you're through most of the American South and, and New England you're gonna call it a water fountain but if you're on the West Coast you're gonna call it a drinking fountain um, now if you'll notice like Rhode Island and and a little bit up there in the Great Lakes you're gonna get bubbler I have no idea where the heck bubbler ever came from uh, that one's a new one on me um, what I find interesting is uh, you know when I'm overseas um, uh, like for example particularly when I was in India I found that drinking fountain is much more common just because I think uh, what I figured out was water fountain refers to like a garden fountain, like a fountain that you might have on like a patio or a courtyard, right? But they use the term drinking fountain specifically to say like one that you could drink from, not one that like squirrels are peeing in. 
And I will say also as just a total rallying cry here real quick, as languages change and things like that, as I said, um, I am a huge fan of y'all. Y'all is the greatest word ever, right? Uh, it has so much meaning, right? You is one, y'all is plural, but more than five is all y'all, right? Y'all is awesome. It's a quick, easy way to refer to a group of people. And I argue it's a term for the 21st century because it's non-gender specific, right? Instead of saying you guys or guys or whatever else, right? Y'all is awesome. I'm a huge fan of y'all. We should, we should get on board with y'all. Uh, and so I also want to talk about verbal versus nonverbal communication, right? Verbal is speech, it's sounds, it's utterances, right? Um, it's writing, right? Things like that. Nonverbal communication includes body language, dress and adornment, silence, stuff like that. Um, um, one thing that I want to mention here really quick is you've probably seen some nonsense internet article that was like, oh, 90% of what you say, you don't actually say. That's a made up statistic. There's no data behind that. There's nothing, you know, to that. It's just too complex for us to even remotely measure, though nonverbal communication is critically important, right? Body language is very, very important um, and, uh, and a huge part of, of who we are and what we do and that kind of thing. Um, and um, e even silence, right? We have, we have all of these kind of rules about when you speak and when you don't and don't interrupt and, and stuff like that that are quite complex. And again, those are totally cultural, right? Um, um, they're, they're not something that's set. It's not something that's innate. It's not something that you're born with, right? Language and communication are entirely a cultural thing. It's not genetic. It's something that um, is uh, um, taught to us from the earliest age. And that is something that I want to um, focus on now and talk a little bit about, which is nonverbal communication. I'll try to keep this brief because we're already about 36 minutes in. All right. This is a quote from Leon Mann in a wonderful uh, article from many, many years ago, back in the 50s, I think, um, that he's talking about. So forgive me for reading out to you, but it's, it's worth it this time, right? Um, he says, it's a mistake to believe that only people with strange and exotic customs have culture. Cultural rules govern all of our actions, including including our mode of encountering strangers in modern cities. A common feature of city life is standing in line. You probably never thought of lines as being cultural. Lines involve a rather sophisticated knowledge of culture. Um, we learn to stand in line from our earliest years, yet this practice would seem strange and perhaps exotic to an Eskimo or a Bushman unacquainted with Western culture. Um, believe it or not, lines are very complicated, and there's all these rules about lines, and they change from one culture to the next. Um, you and I as Americans, when we stand in line, we stand about 24 inches apart. That's, that's pretty standard, um, give or take an inch or two. Um, in Latin America, for example, we find that lines are usually about 18 inches gap between um, individuals. In some parts of Africa, it's about 12 inches that individuals will stand apart. The same is true in some parts of Southeast Asia, right? And again, there's all of these lines, rules that no one ever told you, but you've always known. So for example, if you're standing in line, everybody has to face the wrong way excuse me, the right way. Everybody has to face the same direction. If one person in the line, still standing in line, still maintaining that distance, just turns around and faces the opposite direction, you start to get uncomfortable. You're like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> this is wrong. He shouldn't be doing this, right? When we're standing in a line and waiting, when somebody moves up, you have to move up. You can't just like stand there and wait. Even though you're not next, it's not holding anybody up, but you have to maintain that spacing and distance. If the gap is too large, if everybody takes a step forward and the person in front of you doesn't take that step forward, you start getting really irritated. Like, what is wrong with this moron? How does he not know how this works, right? There's all of these different things about lines and the way that they work, about the way that we move, right? About unspoken things that we do with this. It's a critically important thing to us. Um, and in nonverbal communication, there's all of these different categories and functions and things. And I'm not going to go through all of these and waste your time with it, right? But um, it does a lot of stuff. So some of the functions of it, right, it's, it's ways for us to complement what we're saying, right? Um, that nonverbal communication sometimes goes in with verbal communication. When you're talking, you never just hold yourself perfectly still and sit there. When you're trying to convince somebody of something, like you start nodding and you're telling them about it, right? 
or if something is bad, you're like, I definitely don't think that that's a good idea for you, right? You know, what I'm telling you, like, you should be reading the study guides and, like, you should not wait to the last minute to do something, right? That's the way it complements, right? It can also substitute, right? Um, it can be something where you replace it so that rather than saying yes, you nod or, you know, give a thumbs up or something like that, right? Um, one of the key ones that's really important, and it's a reminder that communication is about a shared experience, is what we call regulating behavior. When someone is talking, again, you, even when they're talking, you don't just sit there and stare at them. It's real awkward, right? Instead, when they're talking, you you will make some noises. Mm, mm -hmm, mm, right? Um, you're gonna shake your head. You're gonna nod. You're gonna move around. You know. Um, you're gonna look them in the eye, but not too much, right? You're gonna look somebody in the eye when they're talking, but you don't want to look them in the eye too much because that's just kind of creepy and you're staring at them, right? But you can't look away from their eye either. It's this real delicate balance of like, you know. And again, this is another way that you were lied to as a as a child. And we all were, right? Look someone in the eye when they're talking to you. If you just stare at people in the eye when they're talking, they get real weirded out by that, right? Um, so there's all these different things, you know. There's different categories, right? Body behavior, things like appearance, attire that we talked about. Um, we can talk about facial expressions. We can talk about uh, body movement. We can talk about touch, right? Um, touch is an interesting one. We, we find that, that um, different scenarios um, and different situations, we use touch very, very differently, right? Um, and proxemics, like sort of being around each other, which we'll talk about in a second, right? Um, uh, there was a study that was done where they took couples, um, men and women, who were dating, and they put them in social situations. And when they were, when they took this couple and they put them in a social situation where there were lots of other women around, the woman would touch her partner more, right? Not in like a creepy way, but just like touch his shoulder, touch his back, you know, touch his arm, you know, things like that more. She would actually move physically closer to him and touch him more. When they reversed it and they put this cup, these couples in a large group where there was almost all other men, then the man started to move closer to his partner and touch her more, right? On the arm, on the shoulder or whatever, right? Uh, and so we use touch to communicate connection and things like that, right? Um, one that I mentioned just a second ago that's really important is proxemics, which is about space and distance, right? Um, we're big on personal space. Everybody is, you know, but in various different ways. Like I said before, um, for Americans standing in line, we like about 24 inches, right? Uh, other cultures are much, much closer. I always tell the story that when I was working in Oaxaca, Mexico for my master's research, um, I remember I would always be asking people about like, you know, directions or getting information from them. And it always felt to me like they were getting into my face and I, I had to fight the urge not to back up. And of course they weren't getting into my face. It's just that in Mexico, people tend to stand a little bit closer than Americans do. Right. And so they weren't getting in my face. It was just a cultural difference about what space and, and personal space actually meant. Right. Um, in America, we've gotten even weirder about it in my personal opinion. Um, if you notice, like if any of you take the bus, I, I always see this when I ride the bus that like people get on the bus and they always put like a seat between each other, right? That there'll be a person sitting blank seat person sitting until the bus starts to fill up. And then like, you'll see some people get on and they'll just stand. They won't even take a seat because they don't want to have to sit next to somebody, right? Until it just gets too much. And then it starts finally filtering in, right? I can assure you that taking buses around the world that is not something that you're going to see elsewhere, right? Uh, and so we're really big on that personal space, right? Um, seating, right? Um, uh, and 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 not just that we are kind of, you know, I, I I bet you, like, it's the same thing of, like, we can be kind of territorial with seating. When we are in the classroom with one another, I always see that I've never assigned seats in my entire life in the classroom, and yet my students always sit in the, almost always sit in the exact same seat every single class all semester long, that within the first week, they've become established of, like, this is my spot. And I can see the look on their face. If they come in late and somebody took their, their seat, they get real ticked off about it. They're like, kind of looking at them, like... Hmm. You know, like, where has this person been all semester? That's my spot, you know. But also seating can, and, and furniture arrangement can really speak volumes about stuff, right? So, for example, um, 
I say, and I say furniture very broadly, just kind of the built environment where we put our bodies, right? And so it can convey things like power. So, for example, um, in our culture, who sits at the head of the table during dinner, right? It's usually the sort of patriarch or matriarch of the family. It's not just some random person. Go into a courtroom. Who is sitting literally higher than everybody else in that room? The judge, right? Um, it also speaks about, like, sort of purpose. So in your living room, I bet you have all of the chairs positioned in a certain way so that they can see the television, it's not maybe the best arrangement so that you can face one another and have a conversation, but it's the best arrangement so that you can watch TV. That speaks to the purpose and the function of that space for us, right? Uh, think about the classrooms that you've seen, right? Every single chair in the classroom is identical and facing the same direction. Every chair but one, the one up at the front of the classroom. It is because the people that are sitting in all of those chairs that are alike and pointing in the same direction are peers to one another. And the person that's sitting up in front of that classroom isn't. That's the teacher, right? And they have a higher um, sort of social status and power structure in that environment, right? Uh, and I don't say that arrogantly. It's just a reality of it, right? Uh, and so these proxemics can really speak volumes.